always said the Black Panther Party that they can do anything they want to do. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. Hey everyone, my name is Andre Walton, the Southeast Regional Organizer for OWR, and welcome to the Revolution. So joining me today is Sarah Yacoub, candidate for Wisconsin's 30, 30th Assembly District. So I'm really excited to have you today, Sarah. Uh, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, no problem. So can you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you decided to run for office? Sure. So I'm a, a local attorney who runs a nonprofit that provides no cost legal representation for survivors of domestic abuse, sexual assault. But before that, I was a criminal prosecutor out in Los Angeles for six years. I am the daughter of two research scientists. I was raised to have a healthy uh, dose of skepticism, but also to understand science. Uh, so I now maintain a balance of faith and science as I, I move forward. As to why I decide to run, my experience as an attorney has given me a front row seat to quite a few problems, uh, whether it be drug addiction, abuse, uh, antisocial behavior, failure to thrive, what have you. And it, it almost feels like a, a responsibility uh, to do something with that understanding, with that knowledge. A lot of these problems don't have to keep being problems. We can move forward on them with simple investments uh, in education, in our health care, in our environment. Uh, that we can produce healthy people and a healthy economy. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons that I was really excited to get a chance to interview you because you have a very progressive platform. And obviously, um, the more people who know about it, the better, and we need more progressives in office. So the first policy that I, I, I was really intrigued in that you talked about on your on your website was healthcare, um, and especially. Right now, healthcare is a big issue with COVID going on and people losing their job and how it's tied to their jobs. Uh, can you talk about your stance on healthcare uh, right Ab now? Absolutely. Uh, well, first and foremost, healthcare is a fundamental human right. Uh, we are not a country that lets people die on the steps, <clears throat> excuse me, of a hospital. I mean, that's never been the case. So it's time for our healthcare system to reflect the values that we have as Americans. We've always taken care of each other. We just need a healthcare system that reflects our values that we take care of each other. With COVID-19, it's more evident than ever that we need healthcare that's not tied to our, our uh, employment and that is accessible for all. I, I mean, it does us no good to have millions of people deprived of access to healthcare when we need everyone to be healthy to get through this and we need people to be able to go to the doctor and, you know, I'm someone who believes in personal responsibility and making per responsible financial choices. It cannot be that the most responsible financial choice for an individual or a family is to not go to the doctor. That That's just insanity. And we can't expect to have a healthy system when it's cheaper and easier to go to the liquor store to medicate or, you know, to drown in alcohol than it is to access health care. So for so many reasons, even before COVID-19, uh, we most definitely need to get people access, need to get people access to healthcare forthwith. Yeah, I was one of those people. Uh, when I was in college, I dislocated my, my, my pinky and it cost me $3,000 because I didn't have health, health insurance. So yeah, the better we have more, uh, a better system of healthcare, I'm all for it. So um, I know we, we can't really have, you know, Medicare for all on the state level because it's it's a little bit harder due to the, the, the way it's structured. Are you supportive of a Medicare for all system on a federal level? I am, and um, not to be a contrarian, but I do believe uh, if we put our noses to the grindstone, we could absolutely have Badger Care for All on the state level, and I actually support it. Uh, starting with taking the Medicaid expansion, over a billion dollars in federal funds are available to Wisconsin right now, and we are not taking them. And so, you know, how many families need that access to health care and the people running our, our legislature right now are going, nah, no thanks, we won't take the money, uh, leaving too many people in the cold. But I absolutely think it is worth looking into a Badger Care for All uh, system while the feds figure it out and using that Medicaid expansion dollars to make it work. And yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely doable if we sit down and work across the aisle and figure out what works for our, our people. I think that's a great idea. I mean, we already have a system in place. Um, why don't we all just expand it to everyone? So, I mean, I'm all, all in for that. And, um, 
the more people who hear this message, I think will be uh, open to that idea as well. So uh, moving on a little bit, one of the things that I think is really under discussed, but you talk about on your website is water quality and um, water policy. Can you talk about your specific water policy and how it affects your, uh, your district? Absolutely. So as we're seeing uh, foreign big money special interests being catered to by uh, the GOP led legislature, we're seeing an ongoing threat to our water. So whether it's the sulfide mines or the PFAS that we found in our water, our, we all share a watershed. So even though our districts are very much gerrymandered and different, if we taint one watershed that has spillover effects into others. And this isn't something where we can break it and then go, okay, we're going to be good now. It is going to be so expensive to try to undo the damage that we're in the process of doing. And then it sort of begs the question, are only rich people going to have access to clean water? Uh, are we going to have to tax people more so that cities and towns can provide their people clean water? Because that filtration system is going to be expensive. And it just becomes an issue where, you know, water is very much a commodity. And if we don't start being smart about how we progress economically, we are going to shoot ourselves in the foot. And, you know, people think, well, I'll just live off a of bottled water. That's OK. We're, we're good. I'll, I'll just drink a lot of bottled water. You take your baths, you take your showers, you water your plants, you feed your animals. And, you know, as a mother, I want to know that when my kids go play in the sprinklers, they're not going to come back in with cancer. And I imagine I'm not the only one who feels that way. And so for me, being responsible and how we grow our economy and how we uh, do our farming practices is so crucial to maintaining the integrity of our water, our food, things that are so central to life. We, we don't have clean water and we really can't expect to grow much from there. Exactly. It's literally essential to life. So we should probably take care of it. Just saying. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really important uh policy to have not many people talk about it but yeah i'm definitely glad that you brought it up um another issue that a lot of people don't talk about that is very interesting is your policy on uh, access to the internet uh, we know more and more businesses needed to thrive uh looking at covid students needed to even just tap into school so i mean can you talk about your uh, internet policy absolutely there is no reason why broadband can't be a public utility if private companies want to jump in and compete, power to them. So similar to how we have the U.S. Postal Service, but then we have private uh, shipping industries or businesses, we can have the same for broadband. So right now where I am out in the 30th, we have people in the city of River Falls, in the city of Hudson, in the town of Hudson, out in Roberts, who don't have access to broadband. I, as someone who drives through the counties fairly often, I can speak to personal experience, not just the issue of broadband, but cellular service. So we're talking an issue of economic prosperity and opportunity. We're talking educational needs, but we're also talking public and personal safety. If these families, God forbid, have an emergency out there and their internet access is spotty or non-existent and their cell phone's not working, that, that, then what? I mean, how do we get them emergency services? How do we get them the help that they need? And it's not like we live in the middle of nowhere. We are, you know, 20 minutes outside the Twin Cities. We have a, we host an amazing university down in River Falls. There's no reason why we should be uh, tying our hands behind our backs and limiting the opportunity for our people to start small businesses, to meet their educational needs. Our small farmers, they need access to broadband. And, and right now there's a lack of competition. Uh, it's expensive and it's, it's not, even when you have it, it's questionable service. Uh, there are a few good, great companies out there that are giving service and working hard and we appreciate them, but we have to do more and we have to do more for our working families. And we have to stop just catering to the people rich enough to afford basic necessities. Broadband these days is such a basic necessity it's time we start treating it like a utility that it is. Yeah, at this point, it's as essential as electric itself, uh, just because of all the access it provides and opportunities. So I definitely agree with you there. Um, moving on a little bit, uh, I, I really am excited about your platform. It, it's one of those things that when you get a progressive candidate, you get a little bit jittery because there's not a whole <laughs> bunch of people out there who, who are so passionate about these things. But um, one of the things that's really personal to me that you talk about is um, legalize, the legalization of cannabis. And um, 
we all know it's still a schedule one drug uh and we know it has nowhere near to the effects of things like meth or cocaine and it's pretty ridiculous that it's still on that uh schedule one drug and as a result because it's on the schedule one uh, we see unfair punishing um in our, our law enforcement uh and how it's um enforced between the black communities and the white communities can you talk about the importance of legalizing cannabis and the possible benefits to the economy of legalizing it Absolutely. So I was a criminal prosecutor, a deputy district attorney in Los Angeles County for California when it was still illegal under a Republican DA. Uh, and we had great leadership in the office. And when we would get a marijuana case, we would give, we would dismiss it. Show us that you went to five NA meetings. So you understand what addiction looks like and what you're getting into and, and we'll dismiss it. Um, as a prosecutor, I understand thoroughly, and also with experience working in the major narcotics division, uh, which handled a lot of the, the cartels and whatnot uh, as a young attorney. Um, but what I had an opportunity to see is that cannabis is actually a gateway out of a lot of serious drugs. So methamphetamine, opiates, uh, if you look at it from a perspective of risk reduction, even as compared to alcohol or tobacco, cannabis causes exponentially less harm. Um, I don't want to get it twisted. Uh, cannabis on developing brain is not something that anyone uh, who understands this would want to see. Uh, but we give kids heavy duty narcotics, you know, for seizures, for example, all the time. So the idea that we can give kids or migraine medicine, um, heavy duty narcotics for migraines, for seizures, what have you. Um, but cannabis is the forbidden fruit where it's the non toxic non-toxic, non-lethal, safer alternative is just bad public policy. Uh, from an economic standpoint, the amount of money we spend to police, prosecute, incarcerate, monitor on probation, cannabis cases is just silly. Uh, it's funny if you talk to law enforcement and you say, all right, would you rather roll up on a, a bunch of people that are drunk or a bunch of people that are high? They'll take the stoners any day of the week because the stoners are going to be, you know, watching their Disney movies, eating their gummy bears and not shooting anybody. Um, it's, you know, I don't want to say that um, people should be out on drugs. That's not my position at all. I think, you know, being present and um, contributing to the world around us is, is where we should all strive to be. But in terms of, you know, someone who wants to check out, go home at the end of the day and have a beer. If you look at the health effects of cannabis as compared to, again, even alcohol, you, you're better off. Um, so what I would like to see is to legalize it and to do what they do up in, I believe it's, um, uh, I forget the province in Canada, but what they do is basically uh, increase the penalties for exposure to youth and uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Uh, but then it's legal for adult use. And, and the benefit to that is, you know, drug dealers don't give a lick how old you are. They don't ask you for your ID. They don't have any penalties for selling to kids who are underage. And they're probably not only selling cannabis. They're selling all sorts of other stuff. So when they say, hey, you want a little meth to go with your pot? And this kid goes, Meh, all right, because they're a kid. Well, you know, what do they know? And so, you know, you get a situation where somebody goes to a dispensary to get pot. They're going to walk out with pot. And it's an opportunity to make sure it's safe, it's clean, it's regulated, um, and it's an opportunity to move forward. Uh, we, being late to the table, uh, as we are at this point, it gives us an opportunity to learn from other states. So to take the good, leave the bad. Uh, so one area where my own party uh, sometimes steps in it is we can tend to overregulate, and that creates a black market just the same. So making sure that we are regulating in the sense of keeping it out of the hands of minors, making sure cannabis is not tainted with you know, chemicals or poisonous uh, uh, additives, but minimizing that red tape so that this is an industry that can really get going. Um, we used to grow quite a bit of hemp during World War II. It was a huge uh, component of our Wisconsin economy. And it was fantastic. I would love to see us go back to that and have Wisconsin's own green rush uh, so that we can pay for our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our schools, healthcare, care, uh, and, and just really get forward. There's no reason to be spending money to keep putting people in jail or on probation or denying them opportunities because they're choosing a joint versus a bottle of vodka at the end of the day. Yeah, I think it's uh, safe to say that's that's a green new deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would agree. 
<laughs> exactly. And and I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, hey, we need to legalize pot for children. That's that's really silly. So anybody who is mentioning that type of argument is just straw man and, and doing some fear mongering. I don't even when in alcohol was legalized, nobody was saying, hey, we need to legalize it for children. So that's a very silly argument that some people use. Um, but yeah, I really agree with you on, on that issue. Um, but one of the underlying issues that I feel like affects every issue when it comes to water policy, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to the environment is, uh, the issue of campaign finance and how it works in our system. Um, we see that those with more money have way more influence on how policy is made and who it's tailored to benefit. Uh, what is your stance on the influence of big money in politics and what type of legislation, uh, would you support or may support to combat that that influence absolutely i appreciate that that comment and that question our campaign finance laws basically make us up for whoever is wealthy enough to buy our elections and that is wrong and it is so contrary to the heart of our republic our country our democracy and you know it i can think of few things that are more anti-american than having us be available to the highest bidder and effectively that's what citizen united did and so um, I would like to see legislation at the federal level to repeal it. Uh, at the state level, I would like to see publicly funded campaigns, especially uh, within the judiciary, with the Supreme Court. We just saw a, a decision come out of the Supreme Court uh, with a very powerful dissent, well written by Justice Hagedorn, who is a very strong conservative. And he, even he said the uh, order uh, again, lifting or vacating the stay at home order was not based in law. And if you look at who was voting for that, they are the same people who are saying, oh, no, um, we shouldn't have to recuse ourselves for our donors' cases. And one justice even got $20,000 in a campaign contribution for a party whose favor she ruled in, in favor of with that decision. Uh, so whether it's the judiciary, public, uh, publicly funded elections, or the legislative um, elections that we're looking to for public funding, I think there's absolutely a case to be made that that's in the interest of public policy and fairness and making sure that this doesn't just go to whoever sells their soul to the richest uh, individual. Yeah, exactly. We need to really fix that issue because me personally, I don't think that any of those big issues are really going to get addressed unless we balance that uh, issue of the money in politics. Uh, so you're running uh, for a seat that is currently held by a Republican named Shannon Zimmerman, uh, who only won re-election in 2018 by over a little bit over 2,000 votes. So I personally think he has a beatable seat or a seat that you could win. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about his record and your strategy to beat him? Sure. So um, let me start by saying when he got elected, I was rooting for him. Rooting against your elected officials, like rooting for your own boat to sink. So, um, you know, he... He doesn't advocate for some of the same issues that that I do um, as the top of his priority list, but you know, member of this community sort of. Um, and he was elected, so let's give him a chance. He advertised himself as an independent, somebody who doesn't like his party leadership, who's a one of the people, and who would go to bat for us. And now, as we're closing out on four years. He time and again proves that to not be true. He is a rubber stamp for his party leadership. So whether it's taking our money out of our community and sending it to uh, disasters like Foxconn, whether it's you know putting justice for rape survivors second to getting money out of public schools for the voucher school system, um, whether it's voting against small businesses, whether it's um, voting for stay at home or supporting that. I mean, he sat and voted remotely to prevent us from voting remotely. <laughs> um, I, I find him to be very out of touch with the people who he represents. Uh, the other thing that sort of inspired me to run is unless you are complimenting him and on his side, he will not give you the time of day. He will not respond. He will not engage with you. Uh, and you cannot be a public service servant, excuse me, and surround yourself by yes men. I mean, if you want to be, you know, adorned by like a king, go buy an island, sit there and, and surround yourself by yes men. But public service has no room for that. You have to be able to tolerate dissent, different opinions, different perspectives. And I find he just doesn't approach the job that way. The other issue, um, he does not live here. 
He lives out of district. In 2016, uh, one of the local papers asked him, you know, what are you going to do if you win? When he was running in a primary against an uh, individual by the name of Paul Burning. And he said, well, I'll, I'll move. That never happened. Now he's lying to people saying, oh, I live in my son's duplex basement. But that's nonsense. Everyone who lives in the area knows that's nonsense. It's public record that it's nonsense. He's been claiming he's at a district mansion as his primary residence the entire time he's been in office. Um, and, and so somebody who's willing to lie about something so fundamental begs the question of what else are you willing to do to get what you want? So it's not just that he's lying about it. The number of felonies and the amount of fraud he has to commit to make this work for him tells me he does not have the moral turpitude to be a public servant or certainly not to be my representative. And so for that reason alone, I think people need to stand up and, and demand better. Uh, what's particularly disheartening is the party leadership around him enables him and circles the wagons. And it's a lot easier to believe the person who you want to believe, who makes it socially more convenient to believe uh, when they say, oh, no, 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 he really lives in the district, but there, there's no problem here. Uh, because then individuals are left in the position of going against their friends, their family, maybe their faith community, their political affiliation to say, wait a minute, this is wrong. <laughs> he doesn't live here. Why are you lying to me? And so it puts people in a bad position that maybe they should just go with it and be okay with being lied to. And I, that is not acceptable to me. I don't think it should be acceptable for anyone else. And the day that we stop holding elected officials accountable for basics are, is the day that we are, check our, our uh, badge as Americans at the door. I mean, so much of who we are as Americans is an investment of a government formed by the people. And if we're just supposed to sit down and shut up uh, while our elected officials lie to us, uh, that's not okay with me. Exactly. Well, I didn't know any of that about him. So oh. <laughs> definitely kind of uh, informed me a lot on that one. Um, so we got the chance to talk about a, a few of your policies that I know you support a lot more. Do you do you want to mention any of any more of them? Sure. Um well, and actually, uh, in my long-winded answer there, I'm realizing I didn't tell you how I plan to beat him. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think being real with people matters. I'm My bedside manner isn't always going to be warm and fuzzy. I'm always going to be straight up with people. I'm always going to give them the truth, even if it, it doesn't feel good to hear, um, because that's what leadership does. And leadership leads with the truth and helps work people through it. And we found that that resonates and that people don't want to be lied to. They don't want you to sugarcoat things. They want you to be honest so that they can navigate accordingly. They can make decisions based on what's in front of them. Uh, so we're doing a, quite a bit of vo voter outreach. We have a great team of politically experienced volunteers that are manning this campaign or uh, womaning this campaign as it may be. Uh, so we, we have a very excited exciting, I should say, ground game to get out and reach voters with our message uh, so we can really turn out the vote on November 3rd. Well, I'm rooting for you. Um, how can people get involved with your campaign and help out? Absolutely. So um, you can go to my website, sarahforassembly.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-F-O-R, assembly.com. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Sarah for Assembly. Uh, our Twitter feed is Yakub, Y-A-C-O-U-B-F-O-R-W-I, Yakub for Wisconsin. And uh, there are opportunities to reach out to the campaign uh, to volunteer. We would love to have you. Feel free to reach out with questions. Uh, one of the reasons I'm running is because I believe public servants should be in a position to respond to their people and to ask, answer questions and to address issues. And we're really not seeing that. Uh, one of the goals for this campaign is to raise the level of expectations that we as a community have for represented persons. Uh, right now, the bar is very low for what's okay. And if you have an R next to your name in these gerrymandered districts, you can just skate on by. There's very little accountability. And there re people aren't really given the permission to demand more. And if you do demand more, someone's looking at you like, oh, something's wrong with you. You're asking for too much. And no. We're not. You can ask for accountability from your elected officials. You can ask for competent representation. You can ask for services. And I am here to present myself as an opportunity to do that. Um, so you don't have to agree with me all the time. We're going to disagree. And that's OK. I think we're stronger for our differences. You cannot expect to solve complex problems from a sim single viewpoint. You need everyone at the table to sit uh, with different backgrounds, with different 
perspectives with different priorities to cover all your bases for good public policy. So um, separate and apart from policy, I, I really am running to give this position back to the people so that you don't have to conform yourself to a one little box of thinking to be able to count on your representative to go to bat for you. Yeah. Well, anybody who can help out, please go and donate to Sarah. Go and volunteer, do whatever you can. We need more progressives in the office. And uh, hopefully when you win, uh, we can get you back on and kind of interview you about how your campaign went and the after effects. So uh, hopefully we can do that. So uh, good luck on your campaign and um, appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Andre. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.